up is Nate Stevenson. Nate is a research ecologist with the USGS Western Ecological Research Center. He's stationed, has been stationed for 36 years in the Sequoia Kings Canyon National Parks. He studies the effects of changing climate and fire regime on forests and how forest managers can adapt to an uncertain but certainly unprecedented future. So I'll turn it over to Nathan. Thank you. Yeah, and Jeff, I wanted to thank you for the work you do also because, because the interim reports of yours have been instrumental in helping us get emergency funding to do a lot of the work we're about to talk about here. So thank you for your work. Oh, thanks for that. And we'll try our best to get those out in a timely manner in the future. All right. It also reminded me of uh, a wonderful little window in my life when in the early 1990s I got to go on those aerial detection surveys back when they were done by helicopters rather than fixed wing. And there was some kind of rule that the pilot had to take a break after I forget how long, but if two or three hours of flying he'd have to take a break. And invariably he would figure out how to take a break at a high alpine lake full of trout. So we awesome. land there and start fishing. It was pretty nice. So we're really going to do a rapid tag team here today of three talks. And they're united by the common theme. We're using the current drought to try to help figure out how we can be best prepared for the next big drought. And we know there will be a next big drought. It's inevitable. And in fact, projections indicate that we might expect more frequent and even more severe droughts in the future. So what can we learn from this drought to prepare us for the future? And it'll, so the three parts are going to be, I'll talk about forest vulnerability mapping. It'll be followed by Adrian talking about causes of tree mortality, and then Phil talking about uh, ways of managing for resistance and resilience. Okay, I see I created my little arrow. I need to figure out how to drag it. A quick roadmap. My talk about vulnerability mapping comes in four parts. So the, I want to just describe a little bit how we're using the current drought as a possible preview of the future, followed by a brief description of the need for vulnerability maps to help guide managers in doing triage on the landscape. And then actually, what project have we got going now to, to start mapping vulnerability across the landscape? We call it the Leaf to Landscape Project. And then since that Leaf to Landscape Project is in its infancy right now, where do we go next in that project? So the current drought is a possible preview. There are two components of um, drought. I'm going to try to get that arrow out of the way so it's not annoying people. Supply and demand. And I, I use a leaky bucket analogy to describe what I'm talking about. So under average conditions, you have your water supply, and that's through precipitation. You have water demand through evaporation and transpiration from the forest. And those you know, the supply and the demand vary a lot seasonally, but if you just take a long-term average, on average, in the Sierra Nevada or other forests in California, you maintain an adequate soil water supply for the forests on the landscape. So what happens when we get a normal drought? What I call a normal drought is when you get reduced precipitation. That's usually what we think of as drought. But evaporative demand from the atmosphere stays about the same. So if you get that reduced precipitation for an extended period, you draw down soil water. Well, there's this new kind of drought that we've been noticing over the last few decades in the American West called the hotter drought. We get the normal reduced supply, but we also now have enhanced evaporative demand from the atmosphere simply because it's warmer than it was during past droughts. And that takes us down to new lows in soil water content. This graph gives you an indication of, of what that looks like. So the vertical axis is PDSI. That stands for Palmer Drought Severity Index, where the more negative the value, the deeper the drought. And then along the horizontal axis, you have year. The background line is in blue. That blue line is if you just assumed temperature hadn't changed across the last century, what would those droughts have looked like? So if all you had was a rain gauge out there, you would look at this 2014 drought. These data have not been extended through 2015 yet. 
and you would say, wow, this drought was pretty much the same as our 1924 drought. So it's a, a severe drought, it's a 90-year drought, and you might not be as concerned about it, but when you add the effect of the increased temperature we experienced in the last several years, that drags the drought down to unprecedented levels. So instead of a minus three on that scale, it goes down to a minus four on that scale. Drought, the direct effects of drought on trees are exacerbated by the high temperatures. So here you can see the 1924 drought occurred in a pretty average year for temperature. It pretty much hit dead on the, the century long-term average for temperatures. The 2014 drought was a lot warmer, so trees have a hotter atmosphere, but they don't have the ability to cool evaporatively because they have to close their stomata and prevent water loss. So that puts extra stress on them. They have extra metabolic stress and so on. So you get uh, a much more severe drought than you would if temperatures were closer to average. And the punchline from this graph, I'm not going to go in and explain it, is that model projections for the future in California can't decide whether we're going to get warmer or, uh, excuse me, can't decide whether we're going to get more precipitation or less precipitation, but they all tend to agree it's going to get warmer by the end of the century. We could be, you know, 4 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we have been in the past. If that comes to pass, and I, you know, I would sure hope we don't reach those high temperatures, but I think we need to be prepared because it's a likely course we're headed on. We're going to get more frequent and more severe hotter droughts, so we're going to be seeing a lot more of what we've just been seeing these last few years. So that brings us to our need to get forest vulnerability maps. We have ways of increasing forest resistance and resilience two droughts like the one we're in, and a couple of the major tools are prescribed fire and mechanical thinning or some combination of the two, and Phil will be addressing those in his talk. But we have limited ability to apply those on the landscape for a whole number of reasons. You know, at the bottom of it all is just funds. It's expensive to do treatments. Um, there's also air quality concerns, and there's different regulations on different lands and so on. So what could really be beneficial to managers is to be able to know which parts of the landscape are likely to be okay in the face of warmer droughts in the future, which are likely to be so far gone that maybe you don't even put any energy into them, but you put your energy into the middle zone, those areas where you know you can make a difference. So you're trying to get the most bang for your buck in managing the forest. The usual way of trying to estimate vulnerability of forests on the landscape is climate envelope models. And those, basically what you do, and this is a climate envelope model of giant sequoia groves in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, you see where the giant sequoias are growing. You, you get an average climate of, say, the last century, so you can define what temperature and what precipitation range and what range of snow depth and what range of climatic water deficit that the groves tend to fall in sort of their comfort zone of climate. Then you project the climate into the future and see which parts of the grove landscapes start to become most exposed most quickly. The thing about these vulnerability maps is there really hasn't been a good way to test them. And, but we had an opportunity in 2014, we noticed a bunch of giant sequoia foliage die back it certainly wasn't on all sequoias, but it was in several areas pretty severe. This has never never been observed before, and it almost certainly was a response to the drought. The trees are probably dropping foliage to uh, maintain a favorable water status. So we quickly put a field crew on the ground out there and created maps like this one. We call these our gummy worm maps. And they're in these little gummy worm shapes because the crews were sticking to trails for both safety and for speed. So in this map, areas in blue, the, the cooler colors had the lowest foliage dieback in giant sequoia. The warmest colors had the highest foliage dieback in giant sequoia. So we can, assuming that foliage dieback reflects drought stress, we can line that up with what the model predicted. And what we found is 
really poor correlation between the model. And I notice, um, at least on my screen, the, the vertical axis has somehow gone funky. But the vertical axis is the foliage dieback axis. So high on that scale is high foliage dieback. There was almost no correlation between the two. What that comes down to is even, even if we were absolutely confident in our computer model assumptions, which I don't think we are, the data we have to drive those models to create vulnerability maps is just not up to snuff, and it probably isn't going to be for a few more decades. So that leads to the question, if we can't really use climatic envelope models to determine what parts of the landscape are most vulnerable, what do we do? And that's where the LEAF Landscape Project comes in. And there's one of the Berkeley scientists up in the canopy of a giant sequoia to do some drought stress monitoring in the sequoia. And a lot of the graphics you'll see are focused on giant sequoia because that's the species we started to focus on with the idea it's so socially important. It could help us sort of as a hook grab funds to go to the rest of the forest so we're not just focused on giant sequoias. And so far, we've been successful at that. So our goal is to take advantage of this hotter drought to let the trees themselves be the gauge of where the landscape is most vulnerable in the future. And we managed to scrape together emergency funds. There's a, a whole series of abbreviations there. The Park Service, U.S. Geological Survey, the Carnegie Airborne Observatory, which is part of the Carnegie Institute of Science at Stanford, UC Berkeley and the US Forest Service all contributed funds or in-kind assistance to get this project rolling. The basic premise is that we have three things we're doing. We're getting remote sensing of the forests, and I'll go into more detail about that. But we have to calibrate and validate that remote sensing. So we have ground truth, where we map foliage dieback, or in plots, we measure tree death. And we have the ground truth of the physio physiological response of trees to the drought. So in this case, there's the sequoia example, climbing giant sequoias and sampling their foliage to see what their water status is. We managed to get some dedicated remote sensing this last summer from the Carnegie Airborne Observatory, uh, led by Greg Asner. And I'm not an expert on. Um, remote sensing, but this is my understanding, is the LIDAR part of the remote sensing gives you the three-dimensional crown map of each tree out of millions and millions of trees on the landscape. Then the hyperspectral imagery measures hundreds of bands, spectral bands, including those way outside of the visible range. And by putting those together, you can identify trees to individual species. Each tree has its own unique spectral signature. So you can identify the species of each tree. And then you can say something about its chemistry and its water content, looking for signs of drought stress. Here's an example map from Giant Forest. All of the light gray, pretty much all of the light gray in this image is forest. The colored dots are what the remote imagery has picked out as being giant sequoias. And then the color itself represents the crown water content of those giant sequoias. So the blues mean greater water content. The reds mean lower water content. We've continued our uh, ground-based calibration and validation of that. We re-went through giant forest this last summer and created a new gummy worm map, there was a lot less foliage dieback. And our current interpretation, who knows how, if it'll stand up the test of time, is that the sequoias did most of their leaf area adjustment last year in 2014. And this year, they just had to do a lot less leaf area adjustment to maintain a favorable water status, even though the drought continued and was quite severe. We're also continuing to monitor a whole series of permanent plots, and Adrian will be talking about those. We're trying to connect the individual trees we've mapped in those plots and followed up to 30 years with the aerial imagery so that we can um, check the fate of each tree on the ground and know which trees died and then try to match that up with the spectral signature to see if we can find signatures of imminent death. <coughs> 
So in and near these long-term plots, we've climbed and sampled foliage in dozens of trees, and we've uh, used a very high-precision GPS unit that allows us to pinpoint them to sub-meter accuracy so that we can take the aerial imagery and we know precisely which tree on the ground we're looking at. And then we had tree climbers go up and sample the foliage for water content, nitrogen content, non-structural carbohydrates, and we also did water stress. All of this to try to put together that big picture so that we can calibrate and validate against the remote imagery. So that's the point we're up to now. And where we need to go next is interpret the data we have so far. And I added, expect surprises. I hadn't thought things through clearly or deeply, but that map of giant forest where uh, sort of the lower elevations in the southern part of giant forest, the trees had a lot lower water content. Turns out that's not because their foliage was dry. It's because they just had less foliage. They had been smart. They had dropped foliage, reduced their leaf area, but the foliage they retained was full of water and could still keep the tree alive. So that was their response to the drought. We need to track recovery from the drought because um, for a couple of reasons. You know, One is the amount of time recovery takes on a piece of ground might tell something about its vulnerability if it's if a piece of ground is very slow at recovering crown water content, maybe it's more vulnerable to a piece of ground that's next to it that recovers much more quickly. We also have to try to get a baseline of healthy forests under normal conditions, which we don't have yet. And it might be a couple of years before we feel confident with that, because we will, like Jeff was talking about, have a lot of lagged mortality um, confusing the picture for a while. And then finally, we get to put it all together, and for reason, regions with the right kind of data, we get to produce vulnerability maps. We don't know what the right kind of data is yet because we're still in the early stages. You know, At worst, we'll need the highest resolution Carnegie Airborne Observatory type data, hyperspectral plus LIDAR, and I know that exists for a few other regions in California also. Um, better yet, we might be able to use lower resolution data of a similar kind, which has been gathered over wider parts of California, but still not all of California. And in the best possible world, we can use the remote imagery from the aircraft, the LIDAR plus hyperspectral, to calibrate satellite imagery, which would then give us wall-to-wall -wall coverage uh, vulnerability maps. So. We don't know how long this is going to take. I imagine it'll be at least a few years before we uh, get much further with this and can start with some confidence saying, aha, this piece of ground is more vulnerable th than that piece. But the whole goal is to be able to create these vulnerability maps that managers can use on the ground. Thanks for your attention.